and very excited to be here with you today, of course, in this, um, let's say, online context. Uh, it's quite fine and interesting. Uh, so I would just uh, like to start by saying a few words on actual musical instruments. So a small disclaimer before I actually start, I am quite aware of the audience that's uh, present here today. So compared to your culture, our part of the world is really quite young. You know, even if we start what we call way back, um, origins of most of these things that we're gonna be talking about is of course Asia. So I will definitely not uh, speak about your culture because I know that it just will be embarrassing for me. So that's why I wanted to emphasize uh, the fact that I will be um, predominantly focusing on the so-called uh, Western uh, tradition. I won't start too far back in time because I know that they can be uh, quite confusing, uh, but there are certain and elements that I feel like should be discussed in order to understand uh, things, uh, specifically culture and music, in a more uh, broad uh, context. And that would be my primary goal uh, of this uh, lecture. So a couple of words on uh, musical instruments. Uh, as you know, there are, say the least, many uh, that we are familiar with today. So tracing back origins and history uh, of some of these instruments can be incredibly difficult. One of the main reasons, of course, would be the lack of evidence that unfortunately we have to deal with, uh, or at least organologists, you know, scientists who actually deal with the origins of musical instruments. But people who play them also can sometimes be led into these kind of dead ends, historical dead ends. I don't think they should be discouraging. If anything, they should kind of uh, just help us understand our own time a bit better. So where do we fall in you know, the guitar in this, uh, let's say, scientific classification of instruments? So we belong in a group of instruments called the chordophone instrument, literally meaning that what, what vibrates and what creates the sound is the string, so chordophone. Uh, other uh, section, uh, subsections uh, of this classification are, of course, the aerophone instruments, where the sound is created by the vibration of a column of the air. Then we have uh, idiophone instruments, which are also important in our history, they are percussion instruments where the vibration is created by the actual vibration of the instrument itself. So a good example of that would, for example, be castanet in the Spanish music. And then membranophone instruments where the sound is created by the vibration of the membrane. So various drums would, for example, fall into this category. Uh, for example, timpani. Then the fifth group, which is quite popular today in this brand uh, new sector would be the electrophone instruments. So where the sound is primarily created with the help of electric energy. Uh, I like to call this the group of instruments that need to be plugged in, you know, to create sounds. Electric guitar kind of somewhat falls in that this category, although it doesn't require uh, this sort of power to function properly. So even in that very precise scientific classification, guitar is always kind of trying to be a renegade and be kind of the bad boy of instruments. What's interesting with um, this classification is that piano was one of the most popular classical instruments today, would be classified as a chordophone instrument and organ, which we might see in various uh, churches throughout Europe, pipe organ, that would actually be an aerophone instrument. 
because the sound is created by this vibration of the column uh, of air, even though in the different classifications, they would be grouped as, of course, um, keyboard instruments. So when we have so much history, and, and we really do, uh, and so much variety is really difficult uh, where to start. So for this lecture, I actually wanted to start from music itself and how it is um, really not only uh, closely connected with string instruments, but almost inseparable. So when we talk about the Western tradition, if we look at the very word music, it again, we do have, have different sources, comes from, of course, ancient Greece in our case. So it's music. And so this was the art of the muses. Uh, to kind of explain, I know that uh, a lot of you will be familiar uh, with this uh, particular side of history, but just to kind of uh, repeat it one more time and explain some of the things. So in Greek mythology, the muses uh, were especially important to artists specifically because they were a very big and important source of inspiration and many references are made uh, towards muses throughout the history of specifically ancient Greece. So they were the daughters of Zeus, who is of course god of all Olympic gods, and Mnemosyne. Mnemosyne was the goddess of memory. Uh, the etymology of the, the word mnemonic or mnemonic devices you know, various studying techniques that uh, might help you with memorizing certain things or facts comes specifically from this. Uh, there were in total nine of them, and each one um, kind of uh, was a patron of a different type of art. So we had four muses. There would be calliope, erato, eutherapy, and polyhymnia. You don't have to remember all of these words. I'm just uh, trying to tell a story here. Uh, they were the muses of poetry. So that would be epic, lyrical, uh, love, and spiritual poetry, respectively. Then we also have Cleo, uh, who was made popular relatively recently by a car manufacturer, Renault. As in Renault Clio, that's the same Clio. She was the muse of history. Then we have Melpomene and Talia, which were very important to playwrights because they were the muse of tragedy and comedy, another of those of quintessential ancient Greek trademarks. We also have Urania, who was the muse of astronomy. And then in the end, perhaps the most important to us, that would be Terpsichore, who was the muse of song and dance. Uh, this group of nine muses was led by Apollo. Apollo was the god of uh, many things, son of Zeus, this incredible personality, but it is important to us because he was the god of uh, music and of course, the leader of the muses. Now, the instrument that he is directly connected with and is said to originate this instrument is the kitara. Uh, one of the first mentions of that word, and it's important to reference it because it's mentioned quite often in contemporary history as one of the origins of guitar. Now, throughout this lecture, we will see that that's not particularly true necessarily in terms of real life, but it also explains how important mythology was and in many ways still is to uh, artists throughout centuries. Uh, there was an accompanying instrument uh, which was said to be the instrument, and that's the lyre, or lira, it would be spelled as L-Y-R-E. Uh, that instrument was said to be created by 
a, a very interesting god. So he is Hermes or Hermes. Uh, in Roman mythology, he is known as Mercury, and he is, of course, familiar to us because the closest planet to the sun was named after him in our solar system, and he was the speedy messenger of the gods. He is said to have taken a set of gut strings, connected them to two different sides of a board, uh, and thus the Lyra was created, you know. That, that's the story, and these nine strings represented the nine muses, you know. Uh, and in many ways, yes, these stories are uh, quite convenient, but how much they represent what actually happened, I mean, there's always um, room for discussion and debate. And of course, it really goes as far out as how much you actually believe in that sort of mythology. Well, it's kind of important because some of the artists that we will mention later found these stories incredibly important, and they tried to incorporate some elements of them throughout their artistic opus. Now, another important person in this Greek mythology is Orpheus, uh, who was said to be this, what would we today perhaps call an amazing virtuoso performer on the lyra. He's famous because of the story connected to his beautiful young bride, Eurydice, or in Italian, Eurydice, and how after she was poisoned by a serpent and died tragically short, shortly after their wedding, he, uh, Orpheus, descended into the underworld, uh, met with Kerberos, crossed the river Styx to meet with Hades and Persephone, who were the god and goddess of the underworld, to beg them to release uh, his beloved bride from this e eternal damnation. And this story in particular will reappear over and over again, especially throughout the Renaissance and Baroque, but sometimes even after the, these periods, and will actually significantly influence some of uh, the lutenists and guitarists that I will mention a bit later in this lecture. Now, a brief mentioning of the what music meant for ancient Greeks cannot really go without saying that it was an essential and core part of their education. Of course, this type of education was primarily reserved for wealthy males. Uh, and in many cases, unfortunately, not much has changed, but it just shows um, how important education really is and how we should value it as much as possible. So the uh, subjects that they were covering ranged from arithmetic, uh, geometry, uh, astronomy, uh, gymnastics, of course, they found this um, incredibly important, but also music. Uh, learning music, both theoretically and practically, as in that you would actually be able to uh, sing and play an instrument, was of truly vital importance. It was very highly regarded. Another instrument that will be featured throughout this history would be a woodwind instrument, so that would be an aerophone instrument, and that would be aulos. Now, one thing that I would be referencing throughout my lecture is how the perception of these instruments changed throughout time, because in ancient Greece, even though music was, as still now remains a bit of a controversial subject, uh, lira and kitara were considered to be superior in uh, with, uh, it's a respect to uh, wind instruments. Um, and it was much more regarded than vocal music because instruments were thought to be that essential connection between terrestrial and celestial. Uh, 
how much we personally believe in this. Perhaps it's not even as important. The thing is that it was of incredible importance to ancient Greeks. And as we know, they played a really incredible influence uh, on what happened throughout development of culture in uh, Western civilization. Uh, now with guitar specifically, uh, there are so many different theories on where it actually originated that, um, and I mentioned these uh, kind of uh, research dead ends, which are inevitable when we are talking about subjects like this, it can really be confusing. I really hope that we won't uh, get a kind of collective headache after all of this. I really want to kind of clarify and illuminate some of these perhaps uh, obscure and unfamiliar topics. So guitar, as we know it today, is of course um, eternally connected and rightfully so to Spain and uh, kind of referenced to as this quintessential Spanish instrument and the pillar uh, of the Spanish culture. Now the reason for this would be found in Middle East. Uh, eighth century, and we are talking about AD now. So these are 700 years plus after Christ. So quite some time has passed. Uh, we encountered a Moorish conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, where, where we can find present day Spain and Portugal, of course, but this is uh, primarily connected with um, Spanish culture. So they brought many instruments with them, of course, with other things, with culture in general, science, um, who were incredibly well developed. Uh, so one of these instruments is the oud, or al oud. Uh, it was basically imported uh, to the present day Spain as kind of a ready made instrument. And it was very quickly uh, embraced uh, by locals. By locals, I don't necessarily mean regular people. All of these things that pertain to this higher education and art were mostly connected with uh, court life. Uh, so these major centers of culture, Granada, Cordoba, Sevilla, which are very famous and made even more famous by, for example, Isaac Albeniz, uh, who is one of the most important composers on the repertoires of contemporary guitarists. And the culture that we have, that we can witness today, just shows uh, the magnitude, the scale of what was happening throughout 8th until uh, 14th, 15th century. So this kind of unique blend of East and West, I believe should provide a lot of inspiration to younger generations. I really hope it does, because in this increasingly bizarre world, we can agree, where people are getting more and more disconnected as opposed to connected you know, and more compassionate, um, guitar can really stand as a symbol of this wonderful amalgamation of all the best that these two remarkable cultures uh, have to offer. So definitely something to keep in mind. Now, um, we are kind of at the beginning of the second millennia. We are still quite far. Uh, in time, of course, in, in regards to our own modern times, but several really important things were happening in medieval Europe, which are not necessarily discussed as much because this particular time period is often referred to not only as Middle Ages, middle as in literally in the middle of old and new, but also dark ages, as in this was a time where kind of not much was happening and also horrible things were happening. And yes, from a certain perspective, that is true. And we will cover some of their, that, those topics because they're incredibly important. But also a lot of 
uh, really amazing and lasting things in a good way happened throughout this time, since the beginning of this second millennium. One of these things is the uh, rise of medieval universities in Europe. So at the beginning of second millennia, I guess the conditions in all uh, respects of life were so favorable that after, yes, objectively several centuries of quite an intense struggle, people would, could finally focus on, let's say, these actually important things. And that would be, of course, education and the development of arts and sciences. This is uh, not as a familiar uh, topic, so I think maybe some of you will find uh, this interesting and maybe learn some new information. I will try to uh, keep it short because we do have some considerable time to cover, so just bear with me. So the oldest, and we will later find out all of the reason why it was important, and in many ways still is, University in Europe was the university in Bologna, which was established in 1088, so 1088. Uh, the other that followed, University of Paris, was established in 1150, and also followed by today that's a very famous universities that would be Oxford in 1167 and Cambridge in 1209. Uh, so why they should be particularly interesting to us is the subject that they were studying. So some of these concept, uh, concepts, such as degrees that students obtained at these universities, they were called, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with this, uh, the Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts were established then so eight or nine hundred years ago and this is still lasting and they, they also had a core cu curriculum which were called the seven liberal arts uh, so they were divided in two groups one was considered to be more linguistic and let's say more practical uh, those three subjects or trivium uh, were grammar rhetoric and logic uh, and this was obligatory for all students that were attending universities, regardless of their field of specialization. The other group, quadrivium, which means it contained four subjects, we might find familiar from the times of ancient Greece. So they were arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Yes, music who is in some places, unfortunately, even to this day, considered a lesser subject. It's important to stress the fact that it was a core subject in the curriculum of first universities in Europe. I think we kind of have to stop to appreciate the gravity of that fact. But it wasn't all great, you know, sunshine and rainbows, because we can also kind of trace back to that time this eternal divide between music theory and practice. We can kind of point that also uh, towards those medieval universities, because they believe that even though music was very important, theoretical knowledge of music was much more valuable and important than its practical aspect. So actually being able to sing or play an instrument, it was not as highly regarded. And also uh, culturally important, vocal music was kind of the only accepted form of music making. Uh, but, you know, people back then were perhaps not as different to us as we might believe or would like to believe. There was also a clear divide between music that belonged in the church and secular music. So that was the kind of music that was played amongst the people, you know, and even at courts. And that's also kind of where our story fits in. These are the origins of first bands, let's say, 
what we might today consider you know, a pop rock band or whatever, that was also uh, present uh, in the musical life of Europe, again, 800 years ago. And some of these you might already be familiar with. So these were mostly traveling musicians. They were of various degrees of social status. So they were not all necessarily homeless people, even though a lot of them were literally homeless and they were traveling musicians. A lot of them were actually employed by the various courts throughout Europe. So we even then see this a uh, very large spectrum of places where guitar belonged in. Uh, these traveling musicians were called jongleurs in most of the France. Uh, then we have goyards, uh, which were closely connected to the university life because they were mostly students. And the kind of art that they tackled was actually uh, satire and kind of that uh, origin of um, kind of satirical take on politics, uh, on church, it was uh, kind of the core subject of their art, which was predominant from the 11th until the 13th century. And it's actually more or less surprisingly very popular today because it inspired one of the most famous, well-known and performed works of the 20th century, and that's Carmina Burana by the German composer Karl Orff. So yes, that originated also way back in the 1200s. And also we have Troubadours. Um, Troubadours, uh, this title was used in reference to many different kinds of artists and musicians. And even in today's use, um, it's actually used quite frequently uh, to describe a wandering musician, you know, someone very artistic and this uh, kind of romantic image of a traveling artist. So this is where all of that originated. And guitar or some forms of that instrument were always present. In this and we fortunately, even though we don't have um, as much um, uh, information as we would perhaps like to have, um, we do have some information that points us uh, in this direction. Uh, a couple of interesting kind of funny bits uh, about um, this period in universities and this is just a fun fact before we continue with the guitar story, was the way they were governed. So these, even today's very famous universities, Oxford and Cambridge, were under the patronage of the state, or more specifically, the crown. Uh, the University of Paris was run by the Catholic Church, and the teachers or professors were definitely the ones who were uh, running the university. But then most interestingly, perhaps, would be the University of Bologna, the oldest of all universities. It was actually governed by students, if you can believe that. So teachers or professors had actual uh, minimal power. They completely depended uh, on their students. Students were responsible for uh, their uh, actual creation of their timetables and schedules, if you can believe the student uh, is affecting this, and they also set their pay. And if they didn't particularly enjoy someone's lecture style, um, or perhaps found it boring, or just wanted a bit of personal revenge, they would actually drive out professors out of towns and just leave them without work. Now, exciting thing about what's happening now is the rise of this uh, online schools, uh, which in like a really wonderful way, a thousand years later, might actually give back more power uh, to students, which I actually think they should. How was this system sustainable? 
it was, you know, the university not only did not collapse, it was definitely one of the most prestigious universities. So that just shows you that really everything is possible. Uh, that university specifically was famous for the study of law. The University of Paris was most by contrast uh, famous for the study of theology. And perhaps to some people, surprisingly, theology was by far the most respected field of study, way above law or even medicine. It was just those sort of times. Now, those students who were present at the universities and were definitely a vital and invigorating part of every community that they belong to, played on various instruments. And one of those guitar-like string uh, instruments is the sitol. Uh, it is a very unusual instrument. It's very small, but we do have some uh, references in uh, terms of how it was actually performed. So it was plucked. You know, it was not a bowed stringed instrument. It was a plucked stringed instrument. You know, instrument sometimes strums according uh, to the style of the piece and its requirements, but is definitely or was one of the most famous and popular instruments of the time. So we are talking about 13th and 14th century here. After all of those years, we have one as in this many, one surviving example of that instrument from circa 1300. And it is on display at the British Museum in London. So that also speaks volumes about how times change and how history can be sometimes particularly cruel to certain aspects of society. And these aspects were definitely musical instruments. While we might think of them quite romantically as these beautiful visions, they were oftentimes, uh, as they fell out of fashion, they were ignored. They were also completely forgotten about. Unfortunately, they were destroyed uh, on purpose, on one hand, in order to repurpose them for something more useful you know, or popular. And unfortunately, a lot of them were destroyed over time. They simply did, did not survive time. Um, but again, we are still fortunate to at least have something. You know? And in this time, we also have um, one of the first mentions of the actual word guitar that's also in the 13th century. And this belongs to the troubadour tradition, to Roman de la Rose, or the Romance of the Rose. Unfortunately, guitar is only mentioned here. It's not explained how uh, it is played, because I guess it was such common knowledge that the authors of this piece did not feel the need that they should explain how it is performed. It's kind of unfortunate for us, but on one hand, it is good to have uh, that sort of uh, written record available. Now, just a small disclaimer here in the middle of the lecture, uh, you uh, will receive a kind of a short PDF document that I kind of put together uh, that covers all of these topics. There's a reading list that you uh, can go through. And at the end, there are also various uh, research suggestions. So that's why you really don't have to worry about getting everything right the first time or writing notes. After the lecture, you can kind of refer back to that PDF. And I hope that it will give you some you know, encouragement or inspiration to do your own research. What I'm trying to do here is kind of look at the big picture, the big story of guitar, and in many ways music, just to kind of explain um, what kind of things were going on and in, in a certain way why we have this type of music culture today. Uh, uh, so 
one of the important works uh, that, again, I mentioned in the document is Cantigas de Santa Maria. This is also 13th century and of course Spain. Uh, his author is referenced as Alfonso X, who was the king of uh, Castille and Leon. Uh, but that is kind of not exactly true, kind of hard to believe. It was probably written you know, by at least one of his court musicians. Uh, but the good thing about this is it's an incredibly valuable source of specifically lute and vihuela music in that time in kind of 13th, 14th century. And it also established the position of troubadours and in one way jongleurs, which I mentioned before, as these very well respected court musicians as opposed to street musicians. So kind of, it's funny because if, even after all these years, there's something that we can kind of relate to with these people. There was always the, this kind of class divide and class fight and which instrument belongs where. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of these, in my opinion, really meaningless discussions, but it also speaks volume on the just human condition in general. So, you know, I will stay out of it for now. The uh, sad thing about this is that although vihuela specifically was a six string, uh, six core string instrument, and one of the, let's say, cousins of the guitar was again, by far at one point, the most popular instrument, very well respected, well known, incredibly popular, we don't have this many, we have this many examples of, of it surviving. Yes, after all of those years, we have three instruments, which kind of barely managed to survive all of this time. Again, on one hand, it's sad, it is quite disappointing, but it's good that we at least have some physical record that we can refer to. Now, um, a lot of Bad things, a lot of good things happen in this very brief period in time. One of the, of course, most horrific events in the history of the uh, Western world was 1348 and uh, the Black Death or the Great Plague. Uh, the importance of this event cannot be uh, un undermined because it affected the world so profoundly uh, that some of the communities that were very or horrifically affected by this event took centuries to recover. Uh, in many cases, half of the population, so literally 50% of the population was completely wiped out. And in certain communities, uh, up to then, they were very vibrant, thriving, had very good socio-political conditions, very wealthy. Uh, some estimates talk about 70 or 75 percent of population completely gone. So uh, looking back to our time now, it really makes you appreciate things a bit more. And these events definitely speak volumes about the tenacity of the human spirit, because it is important to mention that not only people died, but their craft also died with them. So, so many musicians, so many luthiers, people who actually created instruments, they were simply gone. And all of their knowledge uh, went with them, you know. And also one of the reasons why we, we do have all of these black periods because people were definitely uh, literally non-existent. No one at certain points was actually um, engaging in these sorts of arts and crafts, which is of course incredibly tragic and unfortunate. But out of that tragedy, one of the most important inventions in those times was the printing and Gutenberg's printing press uh, and his famous Bible of 1455. And now how guitar plays into this scenario is very interesting because shortly after the invention of printing, 
we already have music publishers lining up. Uh, Ottaviano Petrucci was the first music publisher. He might be familiar to you because the free online source, which I also referenced in the document, the International Music Score Library Project, as some of you are familiar, it's also called the Petrucci Music Library in honor of the first uh, music publisher. And shortly after the establishment of his business, we already have the first book of lute music. And that is the 1507 tablature, lute tablature by uh, Francesco Spinacino. Uh, don't worry about names. You can look, look at them later. I'm just trying to put things in certain time context. Now, he's important because just as the culture, that famous Moorish Spanish culture was fading out, certain other traditions, more specifically Italians, were kicking in and kind of taking the center stage. Now, uh, 1492 is kind of symbolically taken as this uh, breakthrough year, uh, as the beginning of the new age. Uh, because that was the year when, uh, after centuries of battle, the Moors uh, were finally driven out of the Iberian Peninsula. And you, as you might know, Columbus uh, discovered America in 1492. And that kind of marked the beginning of uh, the new age, more or less symbolically. But yes, 1500 is a very important year in that context. And that was a thriving, really thriving um, condition for stringed instruments, more specifically lute and vihuela. Um, uh, I will say a couple of things about the development of musical notation, which was actually quite prominent in, in that time. So, uh, uh, we think of the musical notation today, perhaps we can take it for granted as, you know, of course we have that. I mean, yeah, you have music and that's it. No, it took an incredibly long time to perfect what we today consider as a modern musical notation with a staff system. Uh, most, if not all, of music of that time was preserved through some use of tablature. Uh, this term might be familiar not only to some of you who are already into this medieval or Renaissance music, but also to people who are just kind of trying to learn some guitar and they are kind of picking it up and doing their own thing. They will go online and search for guitar tabs, you know, or chords. Now this system is act actually very important and has an amazing practical purpose. So the thing is that with all of these instruments, no matter how much they varied, they did have certain things in common. They varied in size, in construction, and even in style of playing, strumming, plucking, uh, and there's all sorts of evidence and sometimes contrasting evidence can be incredibly confusing. But what's important is that it was also a fretted instrument, instrument with actual frets. And in parallel uh, to uh, the strings, it actually creates a grid, a grid system, which could actually be kind of graphically represented. And we have um, so many really wonderful examples of this. And it's such an elegant system. Yes, of course, it had some negatives because in comparison to some uh, modern techniques, it was lacking, but it has so many benefits. We can actually learn so much about uh, how those kind of early Renaissance uh, performers actually play their music. We can actually like physically see it. And I included in the reading list that you will get after the lecture, a lot of examples of these early publications that you can refer to. You know, one of the most famous 
from that time was it from 1530s uh, a book of tablatures by Luis Milan uh, also might be quite a familiar name for you because it's also one of the earliest composers that we still have on the contemporary, let's say, classical guitar music scene. Now, a couple of words on the actual techniques of writing tablatures. There were three distinct types, all of which you can kind of check out uh, in these two sources that I put in the PDF. There were the Italian tablature, which used the system of numbers. So for example, zero uh, was uh, referenced to as the open string. One, the first position or first fret, two, second, three, third, and so on. So a very elegant system that might kind of instinctively be very familiar to us today. The only difference <laughs> kind of can be quite confusing until you get used to it. It was in reverse. So what we will say or consider to be the first string, it actually referenced the sixth string. So it is kind of upside down. It takes some time to get used to it, but you know, I, I, with some practice, I'm sure that you will uh, become quite familiar with it. I really encourage uh, doing some research on this because it's incredibly important for the history of guitar. The second most popular system of tablature was the French, which actually used uh, the letter system. So A, as in small letter A, uh, was the open string, B was the first position, C, second, D, third, and so on. Another again, very elegant, very popular system of writing. The third was not as prominent as the first two, but it is kind of interesting from this kind of cultural standpoint and historical research, and that's the German uh, tablature system. As you might guess, see, it was quite complicated. It's quite Germanic in its structure. Uh, and every single note that was represented had a special symbol. So from this perspective, it was definitely significantly more difficult to read that sort of music. But again, I guess with kind of this cultural background and with practice, it was really um, not a big of a deal, you know, as we might say today. Um, uh, something that I also wanted to mention, yes, the tuning yeah. of um, the... Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I have me. a request from a few people yes. while you're talking about these eras. Can, could you play us a little bit, you know, if you have some sort of, I mean. Yeah, yeah, of course, I always have something ready, but I, I should I, I mean, mm. <laughs> uh, I, okay, fine. Well, it's up to you, it's up to you, but you know, this is, I've, I've just got I a just, few requests coming in. I thought I'd pass it on. You decide what you want and what you feel. I, I know. Listen, I really appreciate it. I have a lot of the, this music available online for free. I can give you the links. Uh, and, and maybe playing up with leave for some other time. There are some things I would also kind of like to go through. Um, you know, if that's okay. I really, uh, uh, you, you know, just to kind of explain a, a couple of things that are going on. And also I know that this is quite a bit of information. I just kind of want to go through it um, and actually to make life a bit easier for you when you do your own research, because you will do it, you know, make sure you, you do your homework, people. Uh, and the thing is, with, with this particular era, with the Renaissance, um, so we are talking about 16th century here. Why we have these sort of things now, it's because of the tuning. The tuning system is very important here, and we have some of those remnants um, still available to us today. So uh, a Renaissance lute, specifically, we play all of this music from that time period, was a six course instrument. I would actually love to have uh, like a physical example of that instrument. Unfortunately, I have just a couple of regular old classical guitars. I would, I would like that more. Uh, so that's why I encourage you to really go out there and, and listen to actually see those instruments. I cannot really help you with that. Uh, and to really experience 
uh, what they were like because they're incredibly fascinating, you know. Uh, so this important thing, just to kind of clarify why we are playing it the way we are. So it was tuned kind of differently than today's modern guitar. So if we take uh, the regular guitar and we put a capo on the third position, we can read out the notes that we have. So from the bottom string, we, we start with sol or G, then we have C, F, and now the controversial third string, that's an A or La. That's why when we are playing this type of music, it is indicated that the third string should be lowered by a semitone from G to F sharp. And that's the entire philosophy behind this because the final two strings, again, we have D and G. This is so close to today's guitar tuning, it's almost kind of mind blowing. So the only major difference is, First, that it's kind of up a minor third, but you know we got used to it over time, and you know that's not such a big deal. But the difference is that the third, the major third, is between fourth and third string, you know, instead of today's between uh, third and second. I hope this uh, clarifies things a little bit because I know how. Um, really incredibly confusing this particular time period can be because there's so much uh, conflicting information. Uh, now, just one thing that I'm um, was a very important part of uh, my development, I would like to believe at least as a person and a musician, was uh, one incredibly important invention that made its premiere at the start of this wonderful new age. And these are the 1600s and the origins of opera. Uh, the first opera was by Jacopo Peri in 1597, Daphne. Uh, but unfortunately, it uh, has not survived. We only have evidence that existed, but we, we simply don't have it anymore. Fortunately, just a couple of years after that, he composed another opera which is kind of officially considered to be the first and this is exactly in 1600 and we can almost kind of uh, guess what it was entitled and uh, who were the most inspirational figures yes they were the orpheus and eurydice that i mentioned at the beginning of the lecture and a couple of years after that in 1607 we have claudio monteverdi and his opera L'Orfeo, which is literally Orpheus, this tragic story um, of this mythological, uh, wonderful composer, musician, uh, who is trying to save his bride from the eternity in the underworld. Now, what's interesting with this is that Orpheus conveniently misplaced his lyre, kind of loses his instrument, and is replaced by a vihuela. This uh, imagery is more and more prevalent uh, uh, in this era than in any other. This just shows you not only uh, how much influence the ancient Greek culture exerted on that contemporary Western culture, but it was also uh, incredibly important for artists to feel as if they are essential parts of that mythology. I hope that this explains kind of why this particular mythology is so important, you know, throughout um, European history. I would also very much like to encourage you to actually listen to these works. I've mentioned them in my references in the document. Um, and I really hope that you give them some time because I really think they are incredibly important. When we fast forward to kind of half a century, to the kind of mid to end of 16th century, we have a really massive figure um, in the history of Renaissance lute, and that's of course uh, John Dowland, uh, another one of the most prominent composers uh, that's um, kind of present on modern day concert uh, stages, not only in lute, but of course, it became an essential part 
uh, of the guitar repertoire. It's important that he was a court musician. Henry VIII, the famous king with many wives, uh, actually owned a very extensive lute collection. And it was also well documented that the Queen Elizabeth I was a very important patron of arts in general and music and was um, herself a lutenist. And John Dowland was considered to be a personal friend of the court. Um, so that just shows you at one point how important uh, was the actual stature of these instruments in certain points uh, in history. Um, we like to uh, kind of divide things because I mean, that's just what we do. It's nothing personal, it's just human nature. Um, but we kind of like to divide things in these kind of neat boxes and compartments, but especially with music and instruments, it's, it's kind of not possible. A lot of these things simply existed simultaneously. They influenced each other. Musicians and composers, as well as all other sorts of artists, had direct influence on each other. And this really, um, kind of significantly influence the artistic output that we have available today. And Baroque as a period was especially vibrant in that respect. We have the rise of a very interesting instrument and that's the Baroque guitar. So before the guitar was simply considered as a smaller vihuela with four strings, now we added one more bass string. So it was also kind of gradually de developing, although it took quite some time to, to get there. Uh, so what I'm, I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me now, um, is that guitar, like any other instrument, it all, always kind of needed a very big proponent of the instrument. You needed to have a really big artist to kind of fight for your cause. And at this specific time for Baroque guitar, it was Caspar Sanz. Uh, we are kind of expanding the list of, of these composers. Again, they're kind of familiar to contemporary audi audiences, specifically because Joaquin Rodrigo used uh, Gaspar Sanz's opus as a source of actual musical material and inspiration in his Fantasia para un gentil hombre, which is an orchestral piece. It's a concerto, type of concerto for guitar and orchestra. Another important person in this particular time period is Francesco Corbetta, an Italian uh, Baroque guitarist who was closely connected, again, with the English court. He was considered a personal friend of Charles II. Again, we are looking at a very, very high cultural stat stature. Uh, he is, from a technical uh, viewpoint, important because he was the one who really established uh, this uh, strumming and plucking technique as in kind of combination of both, and is perhaps in some other circles known as this uh, interesting shady character because he was very much uh, into gambling and is considered to be one of the first uh, professional gamblers, you know, so uh, you have a bit of a fun fact for you. Uh, now, the Baroque period cannot really be kind of circulated without the mention, of course, of Johann Sebastian Bach, as in the most important composer of that era and probably one of the most important and influential composers of all time. Uh, there is really not enough time for me to talk about uh, the importance of this person and the opus, really unbelievable opus that he left behind. So I will just like to briefly focus um, on his lute repertoire, which is again quite prominently featured in contemporary guitar repertoire, kind of illuminate some of the things that are perhaps not as clear and a bit obscure, and then kind of try to connect it with what was happening at the time in Europe. So Bach was 
uh, probably one of the most versatile musicians and composers the world has ever seen. But even for a person like that, Lute represented kind of a really specific niche specialist instrument, which he actually did not play. It's confirmed that he did own an, an instrument, a lute, but there is no record that he could uh, actually play it. So these works that we have today, the lute suites by Bach, they were actually composed for a keyboard instrument called the Lautenberg. So this is a very, very bizarre and kind of cool combination of lute and harpsichord. So it was actually literally played with keyboards, uh, with a keyboard technique on lute gut strings. So it was quite a unique, very specific production and very complicated. Unfortunately, unlike those one and three with Sitol and Vihuela, we have exactly this many examples of that instrument surviving today. So we only have kind of approximations and replicas, but it definitely existed. It was um, quite a uh, kind of trendy item of the day. Here we are talking about kind of early to mid uh, 18th century. And Bach was definitely very, very familiar with it. So this is the instrument that we are referring to when we are talking about Bach's lute music. Another interesting uh, part of his opus is his uh, opus 1006A, uh, which is his own transcription or arrangement of the solo, third solo partita for violin. But again, even with that piece, it's not kind of perfectly clear whether it was actually composed for a lute or a lautenberg, you know, this kind of really interesting invention of the times. Um, there is really not much evidence uh, that we can base many of these things upon. It's still predominantly a matter of speculation and these kind of perhaps even conspiracy theories. But, you know, there are a lot of PhD students during, during their thesis on Bach and his lute work, so I hope, you know, they will find something valuable. Uh, one of Bach's friends and kind of the last, or one of the last great lutenists was, of course, Silvius Leopold Weiss. Uh, I actually played one of his pieces recently on, on one of my uh, kind of Facebook quarantine uh, editions of, you know, uh, concert performances. I played one of his Chacona. Uh, he was, of course, an amazing uh, instrumentalist, really brilliant, incredibly accomplished, and uh, a wonderful composer. And he's rightfully so, uh, again, still very much present today. He survived, or his music survived, for all of these years. Uh, his lute specifically is quite interesting because of its construction. So we are talking about 13 strings, a total of 11 courses. By courses, I mean pairs of strings. That's literally what courses mean. So there's a pair of strings, and there were two single strings, which were called canto, or another term which might be familiar to kind of most musicians today, and that's chantarelle, is that they were literally singing strings. So they had 11 courses and two single strings. That's a lot of strings to tune. And maybe in something like that, we can understand why the decline of loot was imminent, even though it was very well respected, an amazingly beautiful instrument with a very rich and varied repertoire. At a certain point, it just became too complicated and it was simply not fashionable. It fell out of fashion. It was really, um, unfortunately, really as simple as that. Uh, and even the tuning of that instrument is very interesting. So we basically have. Um, minor tuning. We have kind of the first instance of actually tuning 
in a key, specifically D minor. And we can learn the music out of that with this. So going from the lowest string, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then A, D, F, A, D, F. So we're actually tuned in D minor. This opened up a lot of really interesting possibilities in terms of actual performing on the instrument and composing. But I guess that, you know, the downfall was uh, unavoidable. You know, it was bound to happen. But at the end of that 18th century, another interesting instrument took its place, although very briefly, and that's the mandolin. The mandolin is uh, quite popular in my part of the world as kind of this uh, really eccentric folk instrument. It's played with a plectrum and it has the same tuning as contemporary violin. And it's played on four courses of metal strings. It's a very a specific sound and I can see how the audiences of, of that late and 18th century find it uh, very appealing. It was so appealing that it was actually the preferred instrument, if you can believe that, uh, of the court at that time. And both Mozart and Beethoven, although maybe this is a slightly lesser known fact, they've actually left pieces specifically composed for mandolin. Uh, Beethoven uses it in his chamber music and Mozart used it in one of his serenades in the famous uh, Don Giovanni. Uh, after that brief reign of mandolin, uh, which some people, yeah, still find it hard to believe, but it definitely happened and it's well documented. Uh, we arrive at the 19th century and finally what we refer to now as today as the golden age of guitar. And I took quite some time. Guitar was always present. So it was not as if this instrument was non-existent or it was in you know, one of the basements of music, uh, you know, museums, art museums. It was always a, a vibrant part of every community that simply did not catch a break, unfortunately. Everything uh, more or less unfortunately had to do with fashion all the time. And 19th century was absolutely uh, guitar's time. And that's why today we have so many composers from that era. So we have from Sor Aguado, it would be Giuliani, uh, Diabelli, Carcassi, Caroli, of course, Paganini, which even some violinists still don't know that he actually left the guitar opus. Um, Legnani, so I don't. I don't want to leave everyone out, but that's why we had so many. It was simply a finally kind of defined, developed instrument. By the end of that 18th century, it was uh, we have first references to guitar being in the tuning that we have today. So E A D G B E, uh, and. I guess it's, its time has finally come. It was an essential part of the European society. Uh, and a lot of uh, places actually, in, specifically in Paris, Parisian and Viennese culture, Vienna, uh, the capital of modern day Austria, uh, they actually refer to this particular movement in time as Gitaromania. And I can see how it was definitely maniacal at some point. People were definitely, maybe not unlike today, felt very strongly and very passionately about this instrument. And it had many heroes, many great, uh, these concert performers, of course, one of the most important ones in this period was Mauro Giuliani. And I would like to briefly reference one of his more important works and how it kind of played into that story of guitar. And that's his set of six fantasias for solo guitar, which are known as Rossiniane. So they were inspired by the operas. I know I've told you I'm going to reference uh, opera music because it's um, inevitable. Opera literally means the work in Italian. So when a piece is called the work, um, it really shows you how strongly it feels about itself and kind of that connection, eternal connection, you know, with Apollo and the muses that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. So uh, Gioacchino Rossini 
was and still is to this day one of the most important and influential Italian composers, uh, most well known for his operas. Uh, interesting fun fact, maybe to kind of break uh, break down all of these uh, informations, uh, is that he was born on the 29th of February, 1792, which means that only this year we finally celebrated his 53rd birthday. Uh, he was born in Pesaro, which is actually another fun fact. It's literally across to the west from where I am now. I'm on the opposite side of the Adriatic coast. So kind of that also puts you in perspective why, why I feel perhaps a bit more closer to Italian culture than let's say Germanic. Uh, and uh, being the most popular composer of the most popular uh, uh, work, music work, uh, really made him again one of the most influential artists of that time, of the beginning of the 19th century. I would really very much like to strongly encourage you to listen to some of his operas. Again, I left some of the suggestions uh, in the document. Uh, he is the, also the one who actually used, physically used guitar uh, in his work, more uh, most uh, prominently in his opera, a very famous one, Il Barbiere di Sevilla, has uh, many famous arias from it, more specifically the Figaro's aria, Figaro. Uh, in, in one of the serenades from that opera, he actually uses the guitar. It's actually a beautiful uh, guitar part. I kind of played it relatively recently in London, you know, and hopefully I, I will again, you know, when I'm allowed to go back on the concert stage. It's really incredibly beautiful music. And when people ask, you know, how to kind of uh, get closer to this time period, how to better understand what was going on, how to play, what are the actual musical styles, I always give one simple advice, and to actually listen to operas that were popular at those times. It is incredibly important. All of these composers, whether they would like to admit that or not, and mostly they don't because they're dead, but they were absolutely directly influenced by this incredibly important work, the work opera. So there is really no discussion on these musical performance practices without referencing opera. That's why it's so important. Um, uh, after that period, we do have what's uh, referred to as this brief period of kind of small dark age of guitar music. I kind of absolutely don't agree with that and here's the reason why. Uh, it's again one of those convenient things to, to kind of help propel um, other cultures in the limelight. I won't get into that but there are reasons why this simply does not stand and that in this period and he lived between 1822 and 1872, one of the truly greatest artists for guitar, and my absolute personal favorite, uh, created all of his works, and that's Giulio Regondi. I play his music in every single one uh, of my concerts. I've recorded his music many times. Like I said before, it's available for free online, please. Uh, check it out. He is uh, one of those reasons why it's simply not possible to say that it was going through a, a, an actual dark period. Yes, uh, the, uh, musicians and specifically guitarists of those time were facing some adversities. That is absolutely right. Why? Because at kind of that time period, after the second half, of the 19th century, guitar was also slightly falling out of fashion again. Yes, that is correct. The, uh, you know, these fancy cosmopolitan uh, societies of Paris and Vienna were perhaps not as infatuated with the guitar as they used to be, and that did create a rift, one of those major rifts 
between uh, guitar and other instruments, some of which unfortunately we feel to this day, but with such a long time perspective and time span, we should know better, you know, by now, that it was simply uh, an, uh, a matter of time and fashion, and that's it. Uh, incredibly important music was composed in that time. For me personally, it's the core material uh, of my concert repertoire, so I'm eternally indebted to the composers that uh, created music during this time, most specifically to Regondi. And I would actually like to do maybe uh, some relatively near future an actual separate lecture on him on his life and works because they are really um, tremendously important to us that they are very interesting really a fascinating life but then and maybe i would like to end here uh, because uh, i i know this is really a lot of information but it's important to i feel like end at least with this and that uh, with all of this cultural and kind of socioeconomic turmoil, there was always this one country that was a beaming pillar of guitar music, and that's of course Spain. Um, Julian Arcas, a very famous kind of this mid 19th century guitarist, was one of the leading figures of that time. But this particular era of guitar music, we uh, undeniably connect with another great guitarist and composer, and that is Francisco Tarrega, kind of symbolically almost born in 1852, kind of marks um, the push out of that, let's say, dark, brief, dark era of guitar music, and he really helped uh, basically propel the guitar into the 20th century and established many of the very important norms that we still adhere to to this day. Uh, I really don't feel like I have to say much about his opus. I think I say, say it best with um, you know, the work that I actually do. I've uh, recorded many of his works. I was very fortunate to be a winner of one of the international competitions that's held in Beni Kassim in his honor. So he is, in, again, an incredibly important figure in my life, personally. Um, I really strongly encourage you to really take a closer look at his music, not unlike the way that I showed in my previous lecture, when we kind of try to go through uh, in different ways, from different points of view, his famous Rosita Polka. Uh, and to kind of also check out what was happening during his time, not only Spain, but throughout Europe, because he was a very famous and very well recognized concert artist. He traveled throughout Europe, met many people, and of course, made significant influences on future generations of classical guitarists. And a very important final fact here, one of the, is that we finally have the emergence of what today is considered the modern classical, or as I like to refer to it, concert guitar. And that was with the guitar uh, maker, guitar luthier, Antonio de Torres Jurado. He was the one who is uh, accredited as actually designing this poor guitar figure. Um, a lot has changed since that time, that is true. We have a lot of changes in size, sometimes even in tuning. Uh, different tunings are called scordatura, another Italian term. And yes, in recent times, we have all of these kind of construction developments with double top guitars and the application of contemporary materials such as carbon. But essentially, it really is his design. He definitely helped in creating his own mythology. He was quite secretive and mysterious um, about his uh, kind of working process. We can call him this kind of modern day Hermes or Mercury, uh, but it is directly accredited 
to him. There is really no doubt about that. The major problem that he created is that he didn't sign his instruments. So even though we have many confirmed instruments that he is absolutely the author of, we also have a lot of kind of uh, these fake Torres instruments, which are kind of murking the waters a little bit and also making this particular area of research a bit more difficult. But I kind of hope that over time, as more information becomes available and our understanding of guitar develops, I really hope that we'll get more information on this and get a more deep kind of insight in what was happening specifically in Spain at the end of 19th century. Now the 20th century, we have exactly one minute left I think 20th century alone could um, basically have at least two or three of these lectures. So I really feel like you won't be disappointed by me not covering uh, this particular time period in guitar history. It's not that I don't find it important. On the contrary, it's actually too important to even to try to be fit, uh, fit in into this particular lecture. So I would be very happy to kind of extended to maybe one of our future meetings. But I would actually like to say just a brief couple of words at the end of the lecture about the future of a classical guitar, as I call it, concert guitar. Uh, I hope that with this very wide overview of music and cultural history in general, that we actually saw how complex some of these things really are and also uh, uh, undeniably directly connected to some of the things that we perhaps wouldn't like to be connected with art and that's money, uh, class, social status, social structure, um, cultural phenomena, certain fashions of the time. But it's a fact. What can be kind of derived from all of this is, and that's why I mentioned universities, perhaps a bit unusual in this sort of context, is the young generations always that are at the front lines of the development of basically anything. And that's why today, well, not only guitar, but the entire classical world in general is facing certain crisis especially after the recent events have kind of helped uh, put all of these things in even harsher perspective, it's really perhaps more than ever up to the younger generation to kind of revitalize the classical community, classical music or specifically classical guitar community. And I really believe uh, that your area specifically, uh, the kind of Eastern Asian culture uh, has the potential to really be a key player uh, in this uh, whole procedure, if you will. Uh, I really believe uh, that by investing um, even more, you know, passion, love, time, energy, knowledge, um, and with having a, such a massive fan base and, and so much actual human potential, I really find that incredibly uh, exciting. And I really think, and I, I believe I can say something to this fact because I do know something as I hope that I kind of displayed throughout this lecture. Uh, I really think that this is uh, the direction that not only guitar, but classical music in general will hopefully uh, take in order to kind of enter this uh, new era. And I would again like to thank Veda for inviting me uh, to do this lecture. I think the work that she is doing for the Guitar Society is um, incredibly important. And I'm very fortunate and honored to be a part of that story. So I hope that you, Enjoy this lecture. Thank you very much.